listening to Bleeding Page Podcast. Join authors Chad Lutsky and Jason Brandt as they delve into writing and publishing the dark side of fiction. Welcome back, everyone. This is episode number five of Bleeding Page Podcast. Um, whether you're listening on, on Spotify or, or iTunes or whatever iTunes is called now or um, <laughs> watching on YouTube, uh, we appreciate it. Appreciate all the comments that we'd be uh, getting on Twitter and, and, and uh, on, on the videos and stuff. Thanks so much for listening and, and uh, giving us praise and validating us. It's That's really, all I care about, really, is validation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 anyway, no jokes just yep <laughs> so we've got um we've got uh you know it's like i i like this like where we're at with the bi-weekly thing because it seems uh effortless i guess yeah um but then it's like when sunday rolls around i'm like oh man i wish we had another episode to, to put up but i agree. I, I don't ever want us to for one i don't want to run out of really cool guests i mean there's always there's tons of authors i mean we've gotten several emails for some reason, they're emailing my personal email uh, asking to be on the show. People I haven't heard of before, mainly. And, um, yeah. you know, so there we wouldn't technically run out, but I don't want to run out of, like, ideal guests that we're more familiar with, I guess. And, sure. Well, if we're trying to help people be able to write and make money in the genre, it's got to be people who write and make money in the genre, at yeah. least to begin with. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. And uh, also, I don't want either of us to be like, uh, I, I, I just can't do this anymore. This is too much. Yeah. You know? So, um, yeah, so I, I like where we're at. But uh, Me too. We had good guests so far. Got some really good info. <laughs> Great guests. And this, this, I'll talk about this one in a minute. But I, I did have a couple things that I wanted to um, talk about first. One was um, I... Well, I, th I kind of, in our discussion, I talk a little bit about uh, doing covers uh -huh. and how I stopped writing for like the past week or so to do a bunch of pre-mades and I sold some and then I decided to go ahead and do some commission stuff, which I have done. I did like, uh, I've done like maybe a dozen uh, commission pieces before, but not in the last you, couple of years. You opened it up now for people to just be able to submit, right? That's okay. I'm okay with that because... Uh, I've gotten better at Photoshop, quicker at it, and um, you know I've been mess tinkering around with it for years now, and uh, I just did, finished up. Uh, dude, I made almost two grand this month on on uh, covers. Damn! So I'm pretty happy, and I don't charge very much at all. Wow! Um, really? So, if you're not charging much, maybe I'll have you do some covers. <laughs> yeah, um, I've I've been selling my pre-mades between like. Um, Set, uh, 100 to 120 for and then, a pre-made that's yeah that's, that's about, about that's right. about the going yeah rate. i did sell one for 75 um and then uh uh commission stuff 200 bucks and i got no problem throwing uh make make it that's a wrap with a around. full wrap full wrap yeah oh dang yeah that's pretty cheap yeah so unfortunately the last seven covers i just did i can't show and and i don't i don't know when i can show them until the, okay. the author, um, it's a in a series, a Western series, which made me nervous at first. But they're I love them all. They're I think they're all great. So I'm not used to doing doing those, but I think they turned out turned out great. But yeah, so if anybody does want to, um, you can go to my website. There'll be a link in the description or in the show notes. It's just chadlutsky.com, and I do have a section on there for pre-mades um, available. And you can kind of, and you can look at a lot of at least I don't know five or six of my own books. Um, I did the covers, so uh, I I like to think that when you look at one of my covers, you can't necessarily tell. Oh, that's a Lutsky cover because I do different techniques for different uh, ones, so they don't all kind of look the same, with the exception mm -hmm. of the series that I just did. So yeah, um, but there's that. And while I was doing these covers. I listened to an audiobook called Devoured. It's book one in oh, the Hunger Christ. series. <laughs> <laughs> you poor bastard. <laughs> I listened to that. And uh, 
I mean, it's only, what was it, like four, six hours, something like that? Uh, Seven. I think it's seven. Is it? Yeah, I listened to that. It's been a long time. Um, I listened to uh, Armand Rosamilia's, uh, well, actually, I had started his a while ago, and then I kind of forgot about it, and uh, because I always forget about audiobooks, because I never listen to them. Mm-hmm. Um, I mainly just listen to podcasts when I do stuff like this, and so I finished up as his first book in the Dirty Deeds series. Uh I don't know if you've read those. Pretty original premise. It was pretty cool. You know, I don't think I have read those of his. Yeah, it's just this guy. I don't know if the other books are like this, but it's like this kind of like um, independently uh, guy that does that, that people hire him to kill their children, but he makes it look like he killed them, and then he uh, takes them and gets them a life somewhere else. Oh, that and is an interesting premise. this guy finds out, uh, you know, the, the the person that was supposed to have been dead had grown up and then his body washes ashore. So um, pretty cool protagonist. He's got the hobby of uh, uh, buying um, uh, Major League Baseball cards and going to trade shows and stuff like that. And pretty cool. And then the, the your book, Devoured, definitely for Walking Dead fans, for sure. If you're, if you're missing that... Uh, just post-apocalyptic, like, we need to get out of here and try to figure out how to survive. And yep. who can we trust? Who can we not trust? Um, then, yeah, definitely should should pick that up because that would be right up your alley. I know that there's definitely a fan base for... Oh, and I got to tell you, man, I was... Oh, I should have brought this up earlier because this would... Uh, with our uh, conversation with Keelan, when you were talking about uh, him stealing your idea for <laughs> sour candy. <laughs> I'm still salty. It's been like eight years. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I think I've heard that uh, story before. I don't know if I heard you talk about it on Final Guys or if you were Probably. telling me Probably. I bitch it. about him anytime somebody mentions his name. I'm like, oh, that son of a bitch. Yeah, that guy. You got this n- negative somatic marker attached to Keelan's name because of the the uh, the sour candy thing. But um, I came up with this... Uh, I, I don't know if I've talked to you about it, but I was going to write a trilogy under my pen name C. E. Lutsky, and it was going to be, um, you know, kind of a right to market, right to niche at least. And I was going to do like this um, vampire thing, but I wanted the vampires to be more zombie-like, like I Am Legend, like the mm-hmm. book. But I wanted to have, uh, but I don't want to give too much away. But I realized when you know, I thought Devoured was a straight up kind of zombie book and then even though my idea was different and it's and it's leans more toward i am legend but with a little bit more intelligence in the the, the zombie vampires or whatever mm-hmm. and i so far i hadn't found any thing or, or not too much on amazon i was surprised all the post-apocalyptic stuff uh usually has to do with disease or um mostly zombies yeah but like the hybrid I'm sure they're on there, but uh, I, it, it kind of gave me hope that if this is a smaller, you know, niche, that, that maybe there'd be a, you know, a, a bigger need for it. You know, yeah. maybe more I, demand. I basically took the vampire tropes and the zombie tropes and kind of mixed them up and did my own thing with it. But yeah, yeah it, so it starts off, everyone thinks it's going to be a zombie novel yeah. for the first hundred pages or so. And then I just kind of put a twist in there one day and it kind of turns on its head. So. Right. I was listening to it. I was like, wait a minute. This is okay. So it was it was kind of a strange timing because I had looked on Amazon and I had Googled some stuff, you know, like vampire post apocalyptic stuff, and I wasn't mm-hmm. finding a whole lot that wasn't like romance, uh, or or shape shifting, you know, that had all this other elements. And so when I was listening to the to your book, I was like, oh, that's weird because this is kind of uh, what I'm good doing, but it's it it's, can be done. It's the thing I'm doing is, is still totally different, but it's it's closer to what I've been seeing. So, yeah, it's one of those things where it's actually kind of hard for me sometimes to get people to read that series because they're expecting it to just be zombies. I'm like, no, 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 it's not just zombies. Trust me, because they're like, oh, I'm so sick of that. I'm like, I just, I do wonder. I was listening to Six Figure Podcast, and uh, I think it was on that podcast. I do wonder if mixing genres like that is a bad idea. If I shouldn't just go straight forward with something. Um, because then I don't know what's popular can... now. So when I wrote the, that series, the zombies were huge. That's kind of yeah. why I, I, you know, I wrote to market a little bit and then did my own thing. 
Um, I don't, what's, are vampires popular now? I don't even know. I don't even know, man. I, I, it's, it's just one, it's, you know, we were talking about, uh, talking with Pat Ivana a couple episodes ago and, and he was talking about, um, uh, and, and I was talking with Zach Bohannon. He had me on his podcast, Creator Dad, and that episode's out. If you want to listen to it, we had a great discussion. And he was trying to help me, um, like, well, do, are you interested in this? Maybe you could do that. And Dan was talking about that too, like finding that thing that you, not writing to a market where you're burning yourself out and you're writing stuff you hate, but finding something that's that's popular um, that you do really enjoy reading and writing, like he did. Agreed. With his serial killer, uh, you know, thriller stuff. And so I thought, well, I, I really wanted to, um, I want, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of drama. So I was considering doing something like that was just straightforward, kind of like soap opera-ish. I don't even know what that's called. Like where it's just, it's, yeah, there's love stories in there, but there's a lot of backstabbing and there's things that go on like a lifetime you know, genre. I, maybe I don't know, <laughs> but and, and I will try to tone it, you know, tone it down and 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 not have many people die and stuff, and or or anybody die. Probably shouldn't have anyone die. Um, but then um, I thought, well, maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll do the same thing, and I will have this heavy drama thing, but it will also be post-apocalyptic. And uh, I I would love to say more, but I I probably shouldn't because I haven't read or written any of it. Yeah. And so I don't want to have Keelan steal my idea. And then by the time I put out the first book that he's already written it. So exactly. He does that. And yeah. he pisses me off. So speaking of Keelan, Patrick Burke, uh, we interviewed him for this episode and uh, quick brief introduction. Um, he, uh, he's a five time Bram Stoker, award nominee and he won the award once in 2005 for his coming of age novella the turtle boy which i have not read i have heard. have you yeah it's great yeah um i think that's just the one, one book in a couple at least yes. it's yep. a series it is um he's written five novels including the popular southern gothic slasher kin over 200 short stories and novellas including peekers blanky sour candy and the house on abigail lane all of which are currently in development for film and tv I pulled this info from his website. So if it's not up to date, that's Keelan's fault, not mine. Fair enough. So uh, it was a good, it was a good conversation. We talked a lot about the same stuff that we're probably going to touch on every episode, but everybody has different answers. You know, what works for them, what doesn't work for them, just their, their experience with hybrid publish, publishing, uh, self publishing. Um, we, we dive into uh, his graphic novel for sour candy that's coming out. Um, Which is outstanding. Yeah, it, it's very cool, and it it might be. I know it's coming out in March. This episode won't air until March thirteenth, so it might be out by then. If not, it's. Uh, I do believe it's up for pre order right now. Highly, highly recommended. I, I don't yeah. read a lot of graphic novels these days, but if more of them were like that, I would definitely read more. Yeah, it is. It is very cool. Glad we got a chance to check that out. But uh, yeah, so here's our interview with Keelan Patrick Burke. Get a lot written today. Yes. Keelan Patrick Burke, welcome to Bleeding Page. Nice Hi. to have you. Yeah. I got lost on the way here. I'm sorry. Uh, it happens. <laughs> it's end of the road kind of place. So I understand. Before we get into talking about your books and all this stuff, I have one in particular. I have a bone to pick with you. I want to tell you about why I personally don't like you. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm always, always here for that. Great start. <laughs> I wanted to kick it off right. I read Sour Candy right before I was going to start writing a story that I had called Milk and Cookies, which was going to be about this child who just shows up in a house and is like the parents wake up one day and there's a child living with them and they don't know who it is or what's happening. They call the cops and everything. So I just was kind of letting the story percolate for a while. And then I start reading Sour Candy and I'm like, this son of a bitch, there is no way I can write this story now because no one will believe I didn't rip this off. I mean, it's a great idea. I mean, I just, you know, I got there first. <laughs> you did. And I was reading it. I'm like, I can't. Mine's, you know not, what? This, mine's not this good. So there's no point. You know wow. what? That, that that just happened with Tim Meyer and I, because for the past, like, uh, maybe a year, 
every once in a while, you know, every couple of weeks, one of us will, will, I mean, we talk nearly every day, but every, you know, like couple of weeks, one of us will send the other one a message and say, how about this? Because we wanted to write some kind of like just no brainer slasher thing, you know, right. just kind of like a fun thing. Mm -hmm. And so we'd go back and forth. How about this? What about this? And then we started to slowly settle on something and we're like, let's do, um, I, I think it was the idea that I had. I was like, let's have this band. They're go, they go way out to this um, house that's, I, I don't know, haunted or something. And they go out there to record just like they did a lot in the seventies. Sabbath would do that, rent a castle or a church or something like that. And then, uh, you know, crap hits the fan. And well, Dave Grohl just wrote that and, uh, and I saw a trailer for it, and it's basically the movie that we were going to do, <clears throat> or the, the the book that we were going to write. So now we're not doing that. Well, I can make you both feel better. Um, at one point, I was 200 pages into a, a novel about, what is this, six or seven years ago, about um, art, about the art world, and you know how it all connects back to people start going blind in galleries when they look at particular paintings. And it gets it escalates from there and the paintings start to have unusual effects on people including art critics and all this kind of stuff and it's traced back to the artist obviously who uh has mystery of her own but i was about 200 about midway through writing it and velvet buzzsaw came out on yeah mm. and the beats of it i swear if i had submitted that book if it had been finished and sent to hollywood and that movie came out i'd be suing someone yeah but because i'm still looking at it on my laptop i just went oh son of a bitch it, a couple of years after that, actually, I think it was last year, I was writing another one. I was 100 pages into this thing about uh, an island in the 1800s, kind of a fishing island where uh, the men go out to sea and don't come back. And it's up to the women that are left to find out what happened. And it's all, you know, uh, monsters and shit. And... Uh, somebody emailed me and said, wasn't this what you were talking about on some podcast or something? And this book was released. Now, apparently it's more of a literary thing and not so much horror, but it was about an island of women who wake up and all the men are gone. And there's something mysterious out on the water. And I went, you know what? I'm just, I'm just not going to put anything out anymore. I'm not even going to think <laughs> about my ideas anymore. I'm just going to just, sit down blindfold myself put earplugs and just go okay start going yeah 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 half yeah. the time i wonder if i just shouldn't read books anymore because i get pissed off that either a it's so good or b i'm like i had an idea similar to that and now i can't do it yeah it's happened a bunch um i mean you know i don't honestly i don't i don't think there's anything to it but at the same time it's frustrating when you have that much work put into something and you're getting excited and you know you're really yeah. into the idea and all of a sudden something comes out or a movie or a book or something or a tv mm -hmm. show is announced and you just go well well that's great you know yeah it's too I, bad I think I, I think I write a novel on average every six years so it's not a case of well that doesn't work next thing put this one out next year instead so 200 yeah. pages is a lot of work that's yeah i was mad because you just had an idea before i did i didn't <laughs> write 200 pages that's you crazy. know what don't blame me blame the actual kid that inspired the novella because that's what happened i went into i mean the first 20 pages actually happened short really? where, where it stops where it diverges is where the car accident happens but <clears throat> before that i did go to walmart and i walked in there and i was looking for candy and this kid just down from me did this horrendous screech and scared the shit out of me. And when I looked, I saw his mother was just checked out. And I, <clears throat> my first thought was, thank God I don't have kids. And thank God I don't have that kid in particular. And then I started noticing everybody staring at the kid. And then I felt kind of shitty about it. And I thought, well, you know, I don't know what they're going through. I don't know what's wrong with the kid. I don't know what's wrong with the mom. Kind of not my business. And as kind of karmic justice, I imagined on the way out. Well, what if I get home and that kid is there? And he's, he's calling me daddy, you know? And I thought, uh, yeah, I got to write this. And a year later, it kind of coalesced for me and I wrote the story. But I never would have if I'd known that you were going to do it. I appreciate that, but you still screwed me. So, well, the, the, this, <laughs> and, and, he double, this and he, he doubled yeah. down on it. And this is a good time to talk about that is uh, because now you have a graphic novel for that, for Sour That's Right. And yeah. my first question is, is this. I mean, is this uh, John Carpenter's name is attached? Is this something that his name is slapped on there, or did he like? Is does he 
you know, choose these or how, how does the, how did that whole thing work out? His uh, wife, the producer, Sandy King Carpenter, um, the comic book line is more her wheelhouse. And I had done some uh, short story graphic novel adaptations for them in their Tales for Halloween Night series of anthologies. And I wrote to her one night and I just was saying, if you're if you guys are reading for anything else, let me know, because I have, I have a huge backlist of stuff. So she said, we'd be interested in doing something with you for night terrors. And I didn't even know what that was. Um, so she explained it to me that it was for longer stories. So I sent her sour candy and we did it. And uh, yeah, he vets, though. He vets everything. You know, he's not going to put his name on something that he hasn't read and approved mm -hmm. of. So from what I gather, it's a collaboration between the two. She scouts out the stuff. She gets it, reads it, passes along to him. He says either yay or nay, and then they do it. But yeah, he's wow. involved. I mean, it's been it's been asked of him before. And to be honest, when I first started doing work for them, I didn't know his level of involvement or if there even was one. I would have thought mm -hmm. the same. It's just the brand name, you know? Yeah. But no, apparently he is involved. He reads everything. So which to me was a squee moment, you know? Yeah. Me. Congratulations. That's really, really cool, man. Crazy for me. I mean, and I That's wrote huge. an introduction to the graphic novel. Basically, mm -hmm. it's just pretty much squee all the way down. You yeah. Know, it's just me yeah. explaining that I've been watching these movies since I was 10 years of age. Mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the ultimate goal growing up was to write something that he would direct. Um, but I guess this is, you know, this is as good as, honestly, to to just have something like this with, with his approval on it. Kind of yeah. a dream come true type thing. If you did a Mount Rushmore of horror, I would think John Carpenter has to be on there across yeah. all yeah. mediums. I mean. Yeah. Who else would be on it? Uh, King, probably. I would think King. I don't for, know. Oh, oh, we're not talking about cinema? We're just talking about horror. In I was thinking it just in general, but well, um, yeah. I mean, you could go both ways, but I was thinking, uh, I was thinking more about directors who you'd put up there. If if Eric if Ari Aster puts another good one out, uh, he, he'd be close to being up there. I'm glad you're in his camp because he can be pretty divisive. There, there are yeah. two two brands of film fan when it comes to horror. There's holy shit, this is just you yeah. know such a fresh. Uh, new voice and it's something to be celebrated my god it's so grim give me more of it and the people who just think give me give me just some fucking hacked up bodies and a machete you know and i'll be happy yeah you who know, would you when it's possible that? to have both you know i mean there's there's great examples of all different types of subgenres. i don't know the the inherent snobbery about certain types of movies over the other if it's good i'll watch it you know? I think Mike Flanagan's yeah. doing a good job right now, kind of balancing more intelligent horror with still putting some screwed up shit yeah. in his movies. Absolutely. And it's funny you mentioned him because that kind of ties into what we we're just talking about. But when uh, Sarah Candy was first optioned for a film, he was attached to that. Oh, and my God. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I'd known him for a while before that. I think I wrote to him after... Um, absentia his first movie came out and mm -hmm. I, after watching it i just emailed him through his website back in the quaint days where you could do such a thing and uh yeah and we got talking and he read some of my stuff and he wanted to do peakers first an adaptation of that um with lionsgate and then years later sarah candy happened and he was attached to that but he's still we still talk and he still wants to do something eventually so you know fingers crossed but uh, he's working with that little writer right now king so i'm sure he's trying yeah. to break away from him you know what's funny and i hope he i hope he doesn't uh, mind me saying it but he said very very early on when we first started talking about adaptations he said uh you know all going well we end up being the the king and darabons of uh <laughs> you know adaptations and then he went on and started adapting king so i feel i feel like i was left at the altar honestly Darabont and Flanagan are the only two. I, uh, well, other than Kubrick, I, I mean, if you want to count, I mean, he kind of had his own vision, but uh, those are the only other two that I care for as far as when someone's uh, taking Stephen King's stuff and turn it to, to film. But yeah, I think uh, Flanagan, he did um, um, Gerald's Game, right? He did, yeah. Mm -hmm. That that one uh, is probably the one that impressed me most out of everything because if you read the book it's like you're gonna make a movie out of this oh, How are you gonna, gonna make that? a movie yeah. Yeah. yeah it seems unfilmable yeah yeah and it's so impressive 
Mm, it's yeah, a great it's movie. really good. And I, I really liked that book and found it very hard over the years to find people who responded that way to it. Most people were like, it's a forgettable book that he wrote, you know? And mm -hmm. I don't know, when I read it, it scared the hell out of me. I thought it was great, yeah. Yeah. I think it's great. I mean, if you can keep me entertained for 300 pages of a woman on a bed not yeah. moving, that's yeah, pretty wild, so... I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, it depends on the genre too, though. There's plenty of uh, there's plenty of books of 300 pages of women in a bed, and it's you know. <laughs> I said, keep me entertained. <laughs> so, uh, I, I read I read the graphic novel. Mm. I thought it was great. Um, it I did was, too. It I was, thought the artwork was really interesting. Oh, yeah, what, fantastic. It's yeah. like a uh, what is that? It's like a it, photographs with. Um, it looks like photographs with. Uh, it reminds me of like the. What was that original Lord of the Rings uh, Scanner Darkly? Well, um, actually, there are two different things. Scanner Darkly is something else. But oh, the Rose you guys... thing was Yeah, that? yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it kind of, I mean, it's not quite like that, but it kind of reminded me of, of something it's that like that. close, I think. Yeah. yeah. And honestly, when I when I saw it, I assumed that's what it was, that it was just, mm -hmm. I, I'm honestly, in, I didn't want to say this, but it looked like we just taken people, posed them, and then drew something over them, like a, yeah. a freaking app on your phone you know cartoonize yourself right but then he sent me the sketches that he did like hand-drawn sketches of everything and i saw the development mm -hmm. of it all and i still quite honestly and he's explained this to me about 50 times i still don't know how he did it wow because it's unique it's just, it is very unique and i think he took a very um cinematic kind of an approach to it, which I think served the story really well. You could just as easily have somebody do cross hatch black and white and have yeah. it be effective. But I couldn't believe it when I saw it. I was honest to God blown away. And I think some of the darker moments, particularly the gore, uh, made it much more disturbing to have it done like yeah. that rather than uh, just a straight up painting or drawing or whatever. Of course. Yeah. And, and the problem is <clears throat> with anything that's adapted is you have to separate yourself from it because you have no control really over somebody else's imagining of your work or interpretation of it. So I always kind of brace myself, you know, whether it's a short film or it's a, you know, a, a small comic or something. And I honest couldn't have wished for better than what he did with this. It was, there was parts of it that just felt like he took them straight wholesale out of my brain and put them on the page. Mm hmm. So I was, I'm, I continue to be blown away by his work. Um, Jason Felix, he's he's a spectacular artist. Did you yeah. have any input during the process, or was this a you signed it over and let them do their thing? Well, <clears throat> I I, uh, I wrote the script for it and um, tried to be specific because you know you have to be a certain level of specific uh, to guide the artist, but. You also don't want to be too constraining either. You don't want to, you know, this guy's buttons must be aligned on his shirt this way or the artist's going to lose their mind. So I put a note in there that, <clears throat> excuse me, what I'd written was really just a guide that if he felt inspired to go in his own direction, he should. And uh, But he, he hewed pretty close to what I had done. Um, and anywhere he uh, he strayed from it was for the story's benefit, I think. You know, yeah. but yeah, it was it was one of the best collaborations I've ever had because um, once I got the pages back with the art on them, I just thought this this there's nothing I want to change about this. This is, just looks fantastic. How is long it your did first that graphic novel? Hmm? Is Sorry. it your first graphic novel? Yeah, I've done some short uh, <clears throat> short adaptations for them for their anthologies, the illustrated anthologies, but this was my first full length graphic novel. That's great. Yeah. That must have book. felt good just to hold in your hand. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it was also, it kind of served a dual purpose. Um, it was the first year of the lockdown. First year of the pandemic, the lockdown period, we'll say. Um, so there was nowhere to go, really. And I ended up doing that adaptation right around that time. So it kept me sane on top of everything else, you know. But yeah, it was great. A great experience. So how long did the whole process take? It took me about, uh, I suppose, about two months to write the script. I imagine it would have taken a lot longer if it was something I was just coming up with from scratch. But as I had the novella to work from, um, mm -hmm. yeah, about two months. And the art, I think, probably took about another six or eight. 
So did you have a different months. mind mindset wow. when doing that? Like, uh, did you have to kind of retrain your, you know, because writing, I mean, I've written a screenplay and it's, I, I don't, that's clearly different and you have to have a different yeah. mindset. I would assume that you've got to have that too because you've just got small panels of dialogue and stuff that yeah. it's like more important things, less like description, less background. You know. It's the difference between Facebook and Twitter. You can say however much you want on Facebook, but you got to keep it short on Twitter. Yeah. So it, it was actually a great exercise in stripping away the, I suppose some of the worst tendencies of prose writing. You, you can write as long as you want about as much as you want, but this kind of trains you to focus it and distill it into only the things that matter mm -hmm. because there's no, there's no space at all for rambling or, you know, monologues or shit. You just got to get to the point and it has to be clearly conveyed yeah. so that the artist knows what you're saying and can represent it that way. Or if you're not being clear with your intent, you get a load of art back. That's not what you were looking for and it's your fault. Mm -hmm. So it, it teaches some discipline that I think is invaluable. And I think screenplays are exactly the same. Yeah. They do, yeah. they do teach you to, you know, stick to the point. Yeah. You Just say what matters really and get your, get your thoughts across, get, get the images across your, for screenwriting, you're writing for the cameraman. And it's much the same with the graphic novel because you are the cameraman and you're, you're telling the artist what to show the viewer. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was it was a fantastic experience though from start to finish for a variety of reasons and one in particular is is just what you were talking about being able to come away from that with some extra tools in your toolbox about when you go back to writing prose. Yeah. Maybe you don't need to be quite as wordy. Maybe you don't need to be self-indulgent, you know. Mhm. Mm so yeah. Yeah, that it is a learning curve. Now, yeah. um uh, I just I mentioned that I wrote a screenplay with someone a year ago, something like that, mm -hmm. um, for the Black Yarn guys, and I'm only saying that because they've already brought it up a couple times. Right. But the, uh, um, I like the screenplay better than I like the book. It, what about you? Did, did you was there anything that you you know changes that you slight changes that you made where you're like I like this better or Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, what I really enjoyed about it was I didn't want to do a straight adaptation where it was just stuck to so faithful to the, to the novella that there'd be little point in anyone who's read the novella reading it for the story because they already know it. But what I found in trying to put in little tweaks and differences was that there was stuff I hadn't explored in the novella that occurred to me after it came out, things I could have gone deeper in or little scenes I wanted to put in that, you know, made more sense visually than they did in literally, we'll say. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I had some fun with it. I threw in some extra monster scenes and I tweaked the ending a bit, which all was kind of stuck in my craw. It was too late when I put the book out. Mm -hmm. so I kind of thought, man, I could have been clearer about that. So I used that as an opportunity to fine tune some parts of it as well. But what you just said is interesting because I do think the graphic novel is probably better than the book it's based on. I but do I wrote notice it more, though. more like the uh, otherworldly horror. I, I I thought there was more in the graphic novel, but then I thought, well, maybe it's just. I think I read Sour Candy. Uh, it's two or three years ago, I guess. Yeah. No, there is definitely. Yeah, I upped everything on it. I I kind of put the pedal to the metal on it because I knew that we have an opportunity here to show things to the reader that you know I wish I had expanded on in the novella, but wanted to just keep it going. Yeah. But when you strip away all of the, the you know. I don't know, rambling from the novella, then you have more space to put in more visuals, put in more incidents and, you know, have a couple of pages of just monster stuff, which I think was one of the bigger complaints about the novellas. They wanted more of that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this was a great opportunity to do that. It worked. I, I hadn't mm -hmm. read the story in years now, but I was reading the novella. Like, did I, I don't remember that quite from being in the book. So I was, I really liked the experience of it. It just felt kind of new. Yeah, like, uh, yeah. An old friend at the beginning and then the end was kind of like, what the, what the hell's going on here? Well, that's, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to. I wanted people who were familiar with the novella to be able to get something from the graphic novel besides it being just a different medium, you know? Because I've noticed that too, that if I, I love a book and I hear there's a movie coming out based on it, I'll be all excited about it. But if it just visualizes the book in exactly the same way as I visualized it myself when I was reading it, 
I don't really feel fulfilled by that. I like when people take some chances, improve upon the source material, or mm. I don't know, why bother, you know? That's interesting. Yeah. I wonder if that will help increase sales, if you can use that as a sales tactic of, hey, it's different. It's different, yeah. Yeah, so, I think so. Um, you know, it's important to me that, you know, if people say, well, I've read this story, and they, they have no interest in this, that's fine. But for people who do take the chance, I like what you just said there. I like the, hmm, I don't remember that, the novella, you know? New stuff in there that kind of makes it worth revisiting. Mm -hmm. But in my opinion, the art alone makes it worse. Yeah, I, for anybody who's on the fence about getting it uh, after they've, I I would recommend it. I'm, um, you know, thanks for sending an uh, electronic art so yeah. we could check it out. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I enjoyed it. And uh, the art is, uh, it was cool. And like I said, when it got to some of those bloody parts, it was like, man, that's nasty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, um, I really dug it. It's one of those things where I just want to make a poster out of every single page. You know, every single panel. I just want it blown up and just cover my house in them. I just think it's right when it gets to the part where the basically the reveal of at the very end mm -hmm. of the big thing. Oh man, I want that yeah. one. It's wild. It's really yeah. Cool. <laughs> That's really cool. So speaking of artwork, I want to transition a little bit into your cover art career. Mm. I don't see this too often with authors. Usually, what I see is authors making their own covers and they're god awful. And I'm like, right. yeah, this is killing your sales. What are you doing here? Mm -hmm. But you have this whole side business where you do this for authors, and it seems to be a pretty big gig for you. It is, yeah. Um, it's It came about because, honestly, I couldn't afford to pay people to do covers for me. When I first got into digital, I think I had something like uh, maybe 11 books at the time, which uh, where the rights reverted back to me from their original publishers. So I started looking into the digital thing and I thought, all right, well, you know, I got to learn formatting and I got to get covers. So I started shopping around for covers and I thought, well, you know, there's no way I'm going to be able to pay someone to do 11 covers of mine. So, yeah, I just uh, basically taught myself the, the finer points of Photoshop so I could uh, I could make the covers look a little more dynamic. Um, and then over time, people started asking me, who did your covers? Can you recommend somebody? And I said, well, I do them. They asked me if I do theirs. And kind of that was it. It just kept going from there. But uh, yeah, much... I'm still... I'm sorry. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say, how much of a part of your overall, I don't know, I don't want to call it writing business, but your book business, I guess, um, would you say the covers are? Because I, I put up on Twitter a couple months ago that I was trying to, my cover artist kind of disappeared on me. And, you know, I need, I'm looking for cover artists and people just started bombing you in it and you were in there giving me the sales pitch too. And I was like, damn, you must do a lot of these. I do. Um, I think probably, I'd say 10 to 20 a month, maybe. Oh, Jesus. Okay. So yeah. it's significant. It is. It is. Um, and it's a blessing and a curse. I mean, I'm, I'm delighted to have it and I enjoy it, but at the same time, the writing then tends to suffer as a result, you know? Sure. Yeah. Has it become a thing where that's, does that make you more income sometimes than writing does in a month or does it seem um, so? Or... It's more immediate income, sure. you know, it's more dependable. Uh, writing, if you put in the time to do something and then sell it to the right person, it can, you know, it can take care of you. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very dependable, particularly when the pandemic happened, which I thought would mean nobody would be putting any books out and nobody, be want, nobody would want any covers. It went the opposite way. So I was absolutely stacked to capacity with writing work and cover work and didn't really have enough time to have an existential crisis over the pandemic itself, which is, you know, great, because as soon as I cleared the workload, I was immediately depressed. So... <laughs> It's, it's but, similar yeah. to what what happened to yeah uh, you know can't afford a cover artist, so the first you know handful that I that I do I just I, I knew Photoshop a little bit from screwing around with it and then just hopping on YouTube how do I do this and how do I do that and then yeah so much trial and error you know just like oh what's this filter do no I don't like that what's this do what it do really do? is yeah and and then putting you know this photo with this one and oh wow I didn't know I could change the transparency and all of this and have this blend really good 
or, you know, I didn't do much, but then, yeah, learning more and more, uh, tricks and trying to, um, and, and just, just recently, um, because of that immediate income, I was like, you know what, I'm going to make some pre-mades and, um, I'm just going to throw them up there. Uh, it's less stress with a pre-made. Um, I'll do what, whatever I want, what I feel inspired to do. And then, and then I was like, you know, and I sold, I sold some. And then uh, just, you know, this month. And then um, I said, uh, well, I'll I'll tell people I'm doing commission. Yeah. And it's so, great. I mean, yeah, that's pretty much how it starts. You know, I mean, if yeah. people are impressed by the design, they'll keep coming back. And because there's no greater advertisement than a book cover because it's out yeah. there. It's infinite, yeah. You know, I, I, I just finished a uh, <clears throat> seven. And you were talking about not right. Yeah, that taking away from writing. I just... Very soon after I posted that, I got a, a seven book series thing that I just spent the week finishing all the covers, haven't yeah. written anything. Right. Haven't had that, time. That is the cost of it. And it is yeah. when I feel all the time. I mean, you can't really complain about it, but at the same time, it, the writing doesn't shut off. So mm -hmm. while you're doing this, like adjusting lines on a book cover and shadowing something, your head's there going, yeah. And in the meantime, your character Glenn is tapping his fingers going, come on. You know? Yeah. And I, I think it's cool that there's so many books coming out that if somebody, um, you know, like I don't feel like I'm stepping on anyone's toes. I'm not sending an email to, oh, no. to Ken McKinley and saying, Hey, what do you think about me doing your covers? <laughs> I'm not doing that. But there's so many books coming out that it's like uh, all these artists that are doing, they don't, they wouldn't have the time to yeah. cover. So you see more and more people screwing around with Photoshop. And and honestly, it might sound strange, but I encourage people to do their own covers, you know, or to start taking it up themselves because I'd much prefer that than to see some of the absolute cringe-inducing covers on otherwise great books, you know? Yeah. Because you'll see somebody ad advertising a book and the synopsis sounds fantastic. It's getting mm -hmm. quotes from respectable authors. It sounds like something that's right up my alley. And the cover is an absolute nightmare, a blinding nightmare. And I won't buy the book because of it. I just won't. Yeah. Oh, well, maybe it's because they did try to do their own cover. <laughs> maybe. But I mean, I figured that, you know, most people have a rudimentary sense of what looks good and what doesn't. You know, so if somebody has an upside down cow that was hand drawn by his four year old and it's a horror novel. I hope that it, there's at least in the book a picture of an upside down cow that was done by a four year old mm. or, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's a weird thing to be a writer and be like, yeah, if the cover sucks, I'm probably not going to buy your book. Right. I don't know what that is in my brain. I don't know if it just pisses me off that you're not smart enough to get a good cover. I don't know what it is. But that's like, it. And, and honestly, I, I'm not nearly that severe. What I will do is is I'll get it on Kindle so I don't have to keep closing it and looking at it. You know, <laughs> it's not severe. <laughs> it's like putting a bag over its head. <laughs> it, really, it really is. Yeah. It's just uh, like, hey, it's there now. It's in digital hell. I don't have to look at it anymore. <laughs> That's funny. That's hilarious. So do you, you, I mean, it sounds like you struggle with the balance then between. I do. The two yeah. Businesses. Yeah. There's weeks where I get lots and lots and lots of covers to do that are on deadlines. And that's all I can do. And then there's weeks where there's no covers. And honestly, I love that because then I just write. It's like being right. on vacation sometimes where I just feel like I'm, I'm, I've done all this work. Now I'm home from the office. Now we just get to write. And no, that makes sense. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm struggling with it with my YouTube channel right now. I haven't written in three months just because yeah. I've been full steam ahead trying to get the second business built up. And mm -hmm. I totally get it. And then I'm now I'm wondering at what point do I try to get the balance right? And do I ever get the balance right? And, and, and I do think it is possible. I think I could probably balance it a lot better than I do. But you know, if I've done a bunch of covers all day, the last thing I feel like doing after them is spending more time in front of the screen. You know, I yeah, kind of yeah. just want to walk away from it, vegetate for a few hours, read a book, something, but I don't, you know, even mm -hmm. if I feel like writing, I don't necessarily want to, you know, I kind of just think, eh, tomorrow I'll write. And then I wake up and I've been booked to do three covers. I'm like, well, shit, you know. How much of your free time do you spend thinking up these incredibly uh, hilarious tweets you somehow do? None. All the time? None. He's just I, a just, witty honestly, guy. I sit down and I think for about a minute and I say, right, let's let's come up with something that might give people a chuckle and then it'll just I'll just say whatever pops into my head and often regret it. Well, really, you don't 
I just, I, sometimes I'm reading. He's like, Jesus, this is like really clever. Did he? It's, appre- going on like it's appreciated, man. <laughs> it's appreciated. It's a break in the bitching. Oh, Jesus. I can't stand it. You know, it's, it, I don't know if you noticed, but you'll never see me anywhere in the horror community involved in any kind of drama. I'm aware of most of it, but yeah. I tend to just scroll right past it because it, it always takes the same thing. Oh, hey, everybody, look what this asshole said. Let's yeah. dog, let's dogpile them and let's talk about it for three days and let me come off sounding way better because I have a superior attitude about yeah. that subject. And context goes right out the window and everybody gets more of a kick out of complaining about that person who said thing X. Then I, I sometimes thing X warrants, you know, it's just, I don't know. I, I find it all kind of ugly to be honest. And it sucks yeah. the life out of you if you just do nothing but pay attention to that thing. All of the all of my close writer friends and uh, the people that I, I associate with mostly and hang out with, we're all very quiet when it comes to that kind of stuff. We know what's going on, talk amongst ourselves or whatever. But social media, like you said, no context, no you know, just there's there's no. Uh, so yeah, tweets like yours are are appreciated. <laughs> well, it's like to sum it up, it kind of just to me starts to reek of. Well, I have a problem with this person. Mm-hmm. If you don't have a problem with this person, I have a problem with problem you. With you, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it becomes this ever-expanding circle of toxicity that's just absolute bullshit. You know, it's I interesting. Mean, I, Every one of our guests so far have said the same thing that they're basically yeah. sick of social media with the horror community, and they just want to. Yeah. Not I mean, I just want to get on there and talk about friggin' '80s horror movies and you know books that I love, authors I love, and you know make people laugh. Yeah. But the thing about it is what I used to think back in the message board days, you know, pre social media explosion was that whenever there was high drama, you very rarely saw your heroes involved in it. True. This is you true. Know? You never saw them come in and go, yeah, fuck you all clowns and run away. Yeah. yeah. yeah you didn't see Lee yeah. Child in the, in the comment boards right. yelling at somebody. Yeah. I, I've lost a lot of respect for people that uh, I could have had respect for and, uh, and a lot that I never even got a chance to because of of that kind of thing. And maybe yeah, and there's an awful lot of people who just seem to be magnets for it. They always seem to amplify it. There are always these, mm-hmm. this, a certain amount of people on there that are always the ones going, hey, everybody, look at what this person did. This person's a shit heel. You know, come come to my Twitter and complain down below and agree with me. And if you don't, I'll block you. Yeah, and I that's very know, true. I so don't you... know what it's supposed to be feeding. If it's some kind of a need for validation, or if it's just an absolute absence in themselves that they need to. Fill I think it is. Drama. I think it is validation. I think that that a lot of these tweets are for. Um, the, maybe they're not even convinced themselves, but the more likes and the more responses they get, the more uh, it, it feels like a pat on the back that they're doing the right thing. Um, in well, the, I mean, the... by that token, we're all pretty much the same because, you know, it's all about chasing the almighty, hey, everybody look at what I said, isn't it clever, you know? Yeah. Like, like, but... like, if I get on there and I say something I think is the cleverest friggin' thing I've ever said and I get six likes, I just want to throw myself out the window. <laughs> it is a thing. That's a lot of why I try to just stay off social media because I fall into that trap as easily as everyone while I'm bitching about it at the same time, you know? I, I frequently fantasize about living in a cabin in the woods, you know, off the grid, just with my my friggin' Royal 500 typewriter and Kathy Bates making me coffee in the corner. I just said, uh, you know, I can't uh, I can't hack it a lot of the time. And unfortunately, there's this pressure in publishing to become some kind of a dancing fucking monkey, you know, where go entertain all your readers all day long, but also be writing your novel all day long. But entertain everybody because if you're irrelevant and you send out a query letter and a publisher goes, huh, 10 Twitter followers. <laughs> it's like they, right, you have to have a, a platform. It, yeah. It's become the new fucking credit check. You know, we can't give you a loan. You clearly it's true, man. Your credit's fucked. So sorry. Does that mindset weigh into how you decide if you should self publish a book or go with a traditional publisher or a small press? <sighs> I go, you know, I remember when I first started doing this, the the absolute dream for me was to have my books in bookstores all over the world and, you know, have the support of publishers and three book deals, eight book deals, whatever, for the rest of my life. But as the older I get and the more that I think technology catches up and the tools available for people to self-publish get more advanced, I don't know. 
I have days where I get up and just think that it would be easier to do it myself. And there are other days then where I think, you know, it takes me a long time to write a book. Do I really want to trust myself with it over people who are professionals hired to basically tell me whether it sucks or not? I don't know. I go back and forth a lot and more and more and more as time goes on. And it, it's it's um, my thing, too, is, Keelan, I think you're maybe four years younger than I am. Um, four, six. Oh, years. so you're 26. Yeah. God, you guys yes. are old, man. Jesus. So <laughs> it's the lighting. But as I get older, I'm like, I don't have time to. Uh, I mean, there are, I, I, I would love to have the, you know, like be like Mallerman and just win the lottery, you know, yeah. very, very obviously talented writer. But, um, you know, there is an amount of luck involved in, in a lot of this. And, and somebody can be a great writer, a talented writer, and, and get traditionally published. And make no money at all, and I think the the uh, if you pay attention to like twenty books to fifty k or six figure author podcasts or any of those, um, you know, self publishing authors, granted, mainly the ones that are writing the market are the ones who are bringing in most of the money, unless you're King or Koontz or mm-hmm. any of those. So I think about all this stuff, and I'm like, well, man, I'm 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 fifty two. Do I want to wait two years before this book comes out, or you know, and and I mean, it's not like I'm staring a deal in the face, but it's right. like I have to spend that that first year anyway trying to see if I can get a bite, and then it's going to take another year or two, or I can just and I write novellas anyway. Yeah, I can take. Oh, I think for from novellas, me. that's absolutely the way to go. I I think the audience that I have found with novellas through self publishing has it many times mirrored what it would have found in New York. I mean, the, the success of Just Sour Candy alone, in, it appeared in guests recently from Suntop Editions. It's currently being translated into six different languages. Um, I did a graphic novel based on that. It's been optioned a bunch of times of various movie studios. And that all started because <clears throat> the day I self-published it, I put the cover on Twitter and it exploded. Mm-hmm. Again, to the importance of cover art as well, but... If the cover will only take it so far, if the story sucks balls, then who cares? But yeah, and all of that I did myself. It was my own engine that drove it. You know, I wasn't dependent on whether or not the publisher decides it's worth putting their weight behind it or just leave it to languish on a shelf and then use that as justification for not publishing my next one. Oh, the sales were terrible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. There's so many variables that sometimes you just want to, if you believe strongly enough in something and you think you can push it over the hill and down the slope then i i don't know it's it's a tough decision to make but people have made it work what you do know, you mostly in, do now in, including yourself i mean you, you know just just the one book alone and with your name and having all the opportunities that you have i'm i'm kind of surprised that you struggle uh making that decision as much as you do whether to put it out yourself because you've already tasted you know the success of just you know just the one book even yeah, well, I mean, if if self-publishing mirrors um, traditional publishing in any regard, it's that you just never know what's going to happen with the next one. Yeah, that's true. You know, true. just because you had a huge splash with one book, the next one could fall on deaf ears, and, and you'll never really know why. Yeah. You know, what? like, at least you can blame a publisher if it doesn't sell. You can say, or blame yourself, it was a terrible book, nobody wanted to see it. But if you're in complete control of every element of publishing and the book doesn't sell and it doesn't work and nobody wants to read it, I don't know. That's uh, that's a lot. No, that is definitely a thing. I wonder, too, if a lot of it for different people comes down to the mentality of being able to look at your own work and try to figure out what went wrong. A lot of people just can't self-critique very well. Yeah. I, and I do think self-publishing allows that if you're good at that. OK, why didn't this book go as the is the cover just not working? Does the blurb suck? Yeah. You know, what, what is it? It's, is the title crap? And fortunately, you can change all that if you're the kind of person who does that. But I actually don't think most people are, are capable of it. I, I mean, I struggle with it all the time. And I, you know, it, it's a thing. But if, if you're able to do that, it does allow for um, fast changes that maybe you couldn't do through a, a larger. Yeah, you can. There's a lot of success stories out there of someone rebranding. You know, oh, getting yeah. new covers, yeah. covers, even hiring someone to do their their uh, blurbs for them, or, yeah. or their back copies, or whatever. And um, yeah, and then the book just taking off just because of you know a cover change or whatever. Yep. 
that's it and i do love that about self-publishing i love i love the, the malleability of it i love that you can you know six months after the book comes out figure something that you wish you had done differently and then do it yeah you can take that debut novel and go back that you're embarrassed of and and make it 2.0 <laughs> that's like literally my first four books but yeah <clears throat> yeah it's great i mean you can fine-tune everything and you know just say author's preferred edition where you know or whatever you want with where you're at right now what is kind of swaying you either way when you are ready to release a book are there you any factors it, in particular yeah it's actually um it's pretty close to what chad said there is is the weight involved with self-publishing when you have a book done edited ready to go for me it's sitting there and i just need to design the cover put it on it and it can go live and i can have it in the hands of readers tomorrow or the next day if i send it to new york my agent has to read it will send me back suggestions all of which are great and you know i appreciate that then it goes through the channels of the you know meeting people to see if they want to read it submitting it to publishing houses see if whatever feedback that can take six months it can take longer and now with pandemic it's like oh well you know our response times are slower which i understand but they've always been slow <laughs> right and then it could be a year and then if they say hey we like it we want to publish it then you go through edits with that publisher then you work out the deal then the book is slated two years from then on their slate because they're publishing 250 other authors and then it comes out and you commit yourself to the book being released um, while they have the last book that you sent them in the meantime, and that's going through the same thing, and it's two years ahead, it's three years ahead, it's four years ahead, the immediacy of self-publishing is its greatest appeal. It's also a bit of a problem sometimes when people whose books are not ready and shouldn't be published in their current form get slapped up there with shit covers, and then that person decries the snobbery of horror because that didn't sell. Yeah. And it's also harder to learn if you're subjected to so much criticism, like literary criticism from a book that was published in a traditional publishing house, um, so much professional copy editing, proofing, <clears throat> you tend to learn those lessons about what you're doing wrong and how to avoid it going forward. You self-publish a book, you have no feedback but reviews. And if you're peddling the book to a known quantity of people, um, to your own horror community, to your own circle, invariably that feedback is going to be hyper positive so you're not learning as much as you might if you give it to total strangers who just went wow you're right tough ass. sorry no, so, I, I agree yeah. pros and cons to both but that was the long way of answering your question is i think that the you know the ability to to finish a book polish it put a cover on it and put it for sale tomorrow morning is is the biggest advantage and the biggest appeal of self-publishing it's it, what always gives me pause when I finish a book and I go, mm, where's this going? Who To whom am I sending this? So for the shorter work, I don't even think about it. I just immediately put it up there, you know, uh, for the longer stuff, because it takes me so long to get one done. By the time that's done, I at least want feedback from my agent and possibly New York editors before I make that decision myself. That so. makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, Jack, do you have any other questions? No, I was just going to say, did you want to ask the, the two uh, questions that we normally ask in regard to specifically self-publishing? I suppose we can do that. <laughs> it doesn't just have to be self-publishing, but maybe in your career in general, what's the one thing you've done where you're like, wow, that was an utter waste of my time, and I wish I had not done that because it didn't move the needle at all? Who? Um... Oh, um this is actually an ongoing thing but i was contacted by a company that uh wanted to do my books in chapters at a chapter at a time through an app in the i store or whatever people would pay tokens and you probably you guys probably experienced it yourself there's a, there are a lot of them going around trying to recruit authors for this right. thing sounds like Vel vellum is that is that what the or, or no, what, what's the name of the new thing that amazon's doing Oh, uh, yeah. Isn't that what it's called, Vellum? It might be yeah. called Vellum. Yeah. yeah. But this is app-based. This mm -hmm. is like a bunch of 
tech bras out there going, you know what we're going to do? We're going to bu buy a bunch of books and we're going to deliver them a chapter at a time through to, to, to your phone. And if you're hooked, you spend some credits and read the next chapter. So early on, when that was first becoming a thing, a company wanted to do kin. Um, so I said, yeah, sounds interesting. You know, it's worth a shot. Let's see what it is. So I went through their editing process. You know, they wanted to change certain things. I was like, fine, whatever. Um, but I think it took about six months of going over and back with them before they published it. They put the worst fucking cover art I've ever seen on it. <laughs> like, literally, people have had diarrhea and done better art. But I just went, oh, Jesus. And then they changed the title. And between the title and the cover, it looked like a zombie novel, which it, if, I don't know if you're familiar with the book. It absolutely yeah, is not. Yeah, I've read it. Yeah, it, it's really not a zombie novel. So it didn't sell shit because I wouldn't have bought it with that cover and that title. And then about three months into it, I think I had made a, pro a profit of $11 by then. Wow. Yeah. That sounds like a bad mistake, yeah. And then they wrote to me and asked me if I would remove all objectionable material from it. The what? gore, the gore, the, the bad language, the, basically everything. <laughs> what the hell? And I said, I will absolutely not. And I am pulling the book. So it was, it was an absolute catastrophic waste of time. Something tells me they are not doing that anymore. Like, no, they're gone. It doesn't now. exist. Yeah. What yeah. a shock. I can't mm -hmm. believe that. Yeah. I know that's a bigger thing in romance. I didn't realize companies were trying to do that with horror. That feels like a terrible idea. I've mm -hmm. been approached with by two other companies since then. I just ignored the emails. I'm not, you know. Sure. Forget it. I, I'm I'm kind of eager to embrace new technologies. I'm not somebody who says we must only have yeah. physical books, and that's it. I like the idea, though, of, you know, adapting to suit whatever means of conveyance you have for books but there's also an awful lot of opportunists out there who just think oh i saw your books popular on amazon give it to me and let me charge people for it at a chapter at a time and while in theory that's not a bad idea nobody's implementing it right that i have seen anyway well i think taking a book that has a good title and a good cover and has a known sales history and then changing all of that that's yeah, like a good idea yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. So what thing have you done that has paid the most dividends that has really moved you forward in the most positive way? Hmm. Other than um, somehow stealing my idea for milk and cookies. <laughs> I will, you just stole my answer. So we're even now. Um, honestly, I think what I was talking about earlier when, when Sour Candy was done, I think doing that cover for it, which honestly I get asked a lot about, but I didn't put a whole lot of thought into it. Um, but when it was done, posting it on uh, on Twitter, which just exploded in a way that few things have since. And it was I think it was like 10 o'clock at night. So I was, I was pretty much done for the day. And I just went, oh, that covers. I, I dig it. Books out. Boink. And, you, you know, you don't make a couple of hundred responses normally. But this was just went friggin out the window. And among the people who responded was Ryan Turek at Blumhouse. Who wrote and just asks, how do I read this? And I sent it to him and Blumhouse ended up optioning it where they had it for about three years and went through various directors and everything, but including Mike Flanagan. Um, so yeah, that kind of uh I don't know, it just escalated from there. The whole the whole package that was sour candy seemed to just hit people the right way at the right time. I think if I'd waited a week, maybe it wouldn't have. Hmm. I don't so, know if I knew who you were when I saw that cover the first time, and I thought, "God damn, I got to read that book." I don't know if I knew who I was when you saw that cover either, but um, it was uh, depends on when you catch me. But yeah, it was weird because I had ten a tendency to try and illustrate scenes, or you know, on my covers from the books themselves. But this was just more kind of stripped down, and I did the same with Blanky as well, which is just a baby carriage white on black and i don't know i think that stark thing kind of resonated with people so i just went with it yeah probably so Plus, good it's covers easy to see on a thumbnail too 
that's yeah. kind of critical for me yeah i like i like because you're in so much competition with people scrolling and people's own attention spans that if it's something that catches the eye mm. and it happened again recently actually where uh, during the pandemic a director was at home scrolling through uh ibooks is it like uh, um, uh, apple's thing mm -hmm. bookstore and came upon blanky and he read it based on the cover and we're trying to get something going now for nice. that but yeah i mean just random he could have he could have found a million different books on there but blanky is the one that the cover struck him and he went hmm what's this now and that's really what you want whether it's a director whether it's a librarian whether it's a reader especially if it's a reader that's what you want absolutely you want, you want to pause the scroll finger you know yeah. it sounds like a james bond movie scroll finger but you know <laughs> <laughs> you want them to you want them to say well this is worth a closer look yeah you want your book to be the one they choose yeah, yeah they can't yeah. buy it if they don't click on it because the cover art's great it's exactly just, just the way it is yeah well thank you so much where can people find you to get these book covers to get their own killer artwork and read some um, candy i'm on elderlemondesign.net um and keelanpatrickburke.com that'll pretty much lead you everywhere else so it's a nice hub for all of that because, you know, people say, oh, tell me where all your social media is. I'm like, just go to my website. It's all there. And if I don't bore you by the time you've done with the website, you can find the links. And if you do bore me, I'll never know you were there anyway. Outstanding. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah thanks thanks, for, thanks for agreeing to come on and sharing all your, your knowledge with us, man. Appreciate yeah, it. Anytime. Anytime.